so it might be kind of a brief lecture. Something that we do occasionally want to do and we'll want to do, I think in chapter nine or some later chapter is um, factoring or working with trig expressions. And this idea isn't particularly fancy. Yeah, this idea is just the observation that, I mean, if you have a statement, for example, that x squared minus y squared is x minus y times x plus y, we normally think of that as a statement about um, numbers, but it's also true, for example, that the sine squared x minus the cosine squared of x is the sine of x minus the cosine of x times the sine of x plus the cosine of x. And this idea that we can sometimes treat, you know, trig functions in the same way that we treat variables has its has some interesting results. I mean, for example, oh yeah, we will start with this. It's two times the sine squared of x plus five times the sine of x minus one equals zero. This has an infinite number of solutions, but let's just find one of them. And let me get our calculator up because we're going to need to use the arc sign in a moment. Um, this is based, or solving this, is based on the idea that we've got, well, we've got two times something squared plus five times something minus a number equals zero. If we give this sign a name, then what we do here is probably going to become more evident. If we let u be the sign of x, for example, if we give this that name, then that equation, which we previously did not know how to solve, suddenly turns into something that we at least hypothetically do know how to solve. I mean, I, I don't know how, how well we all remember the quadratic formula, but u is negative five plus or minus the square root five squared minus four times a times c, all divided by two times a, which let me 
Let me see if I can enter this into our calculator without, without making mistakes. Negative five plus the square root. Our calculator doesn't have a plus or minus button, so we have to enter it twice. Five squared minus four times two times negative one. Of course, could simplify this. You know, four times two is eight times next, but um, negative five plus that square root divided by four. So point one eight six one. And then, so one thing we can do on our calculator, there's this entry command down here in blue. If we press the second button and then the enter button, this will pop up again. And instead of recopying all of this, we can just scroll over and turn that addition into subtraction and get negative 2.686. Two. And these are not the solutions to the not the solutions to the equation, because the solution to the equation is asking what x is, and we found what u is. But u is the sign of x. The sine of x equals uh, negative, or rather positive, 0 0.1861. Or the sine of x equals negative 2.686. As a matter of fact, only one of these can occur. Um, and that's because the sign is stuck between negative one and one. Remember that the sign is a y coordinate of a unit circle. It's stuck between negative one and positive one. So therefore, the second equation is kind of an illusion or a red herring. Um, the sine of x can't equal that. But for this first equation, we can use the arc sign to get a solution. It uh, won't be the only solution. You know, that's, uh, that's a thing that happens when we use inverse trig functions. But arc sine of point one eight six one, we get point one eight seven two. Huh. 
0.1872, it's just, it's just a coincidence that the arc side is so close to the sign. Let's see, going back and let's go here. Smooth.com. Where am I? Here's where I want to be. Two sine squared plus five sine x minus one. I don't know. Ah, it does does that fine? Two sine squared of x. Short term memory of a goldfish, I swear, plus five sine x minus one. You want to know where this equals equals zero, and it equals zero a bunch of places, but using the arc sign and the Pythagorean theorem and all of that, we found a solution, 0.187. And we'll talk about this later, but once we find a solution, we can find the others if we need them. So this is kind of classic in the, because quadratics are sort of what we're able to, to deal with, but you can think of any equation where you've got sines or cosines or tangents or whatever. It really only works if you just have one type of trig function, but you know, if you have cosine squared of x minus five times the cosine of x over three equals zero, Again, this is something that you can do a substitution and then hit it with the quadratic formula. Um, so because we're doing the same process, um, we have to multiply the both sides by three, but But multiplying zero by three does not give you three. What am I saying? Multiplying zero by three just gives you zero. And then you could do the same type of thing. Here we could maybe get away with not using the quadratic formula, depending on how comfortable we are with just pulling a u out and using the zero product property. So it's true in general, that this method at least when we have quadratics this method is expected to give us equations that have no solutions along with the equation that we actually care about so what happened last time wasn't some kind of fluke U is the cosine of x. You the cosine of x equals 
fours, five that has no solution. And it's not the end of the world if you fail to recognize that. I mean, if you try to use your calculator to find the arc cosine, it will just spit an error message at you. And that's your calculator's way of letting you know that there are no solutions. On the other hand, the cosine of x equals zero, we might be able to get a solution just off the top of our heads without um, descending and using the calculator. The cosine of pi over two is zero. And again, that's that's not the only um, the only solution, but it's good enough for the moment. So what I was sort of saying earlier, I mean, traditionally, we um, we look at quadratic expressions with the sine and the cosine, and that's um. That's just because this is a classroom and students need to be able to solve equations and we can solve a quad quadratics, whereas we cannot solve a fifth degree equation, for example. But I mean, there's nothing fundamentally Stopping you from using the same type of technique. If instead of a square, you have some higher power, you are going to end up with a polynomial that we need a calculator or a computer to deal with. Two u to the fifth minus two u cubed plus u squared minus four u. I set this equal to one. So this equal was one where we could move everything onto the left. That's equals one. And then I'm just saying, well. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Going no, no, no one's no one's keeping their prior race markers in the room. I'll just this most and go back and forth. Two u cubed minus two, I mean two u to the fifth minus two u cubed. plus u squared minus 4u minus 1. And it's just kind of the reason that I, that I rewrote it this way is that since I'm using Desmos, Desmos will find where something equals zero, really easily without a lot of hassle. You just have to click around. If we wanted to know where this 
if we wanted to know where this equals one, it's just a little extra work. We find, we say, okay, but we want this to be one, so we'll plot one, and then Desmos will tell us where these things intersect, but I just wanted to do that. So the cosine of X is negative 1.457, or the cosine of X is negative 0.231, or the cosine of X is 1.374, but of those equations, only one of them has a solution. Which one has a solution? Um, the negative 0 0.231. That's correct. Like the sine, the cosine is stuck between negative 1 and 1. Negative 2, 0 0.231. That's U, U is the cosine. So again, this is an equation that's going to have infinitely many solutions, but we'll get one of those using the arc cosine. One point eight zero four. Let's take a look. Of course. I mean, there admittedly is kind of the question, well, if we're using Desmos to find these roots and we're not doing everything by hand, then what's this U substitution even for? Why don't we just go to Desmos and plug in two cosine fifths minus two cosine cubed. Huh, interesting. Cosine squared, it doesn't mind, but having a bigger power than two up here, it doesn't want that. So we'll have to type in two cosine to the fifth, minus two cosine cubed plus cosine squared minus four times the cosine minus one and let me see. 1.804, as I hope. Yes, it was what we got. Um, the way, I don't know what the, what the perfect math curriculum would look like. Um, it is true, I mean, that we teach stuff like this in trigonometry and then most of the people who use, who are taking a trigonometry class would never in a million years be confronted with something that looks like cosine to the fifth minus cosine cubed. Um, but these polynomials of sines and cosines 
do show up in very important and very concrete contexts. And I am absolutely blanking on the name of the discipline. It's absolutely shameful. But when people want to study functions that are sort of periodic, but not quite waves, like the cosine and sine, well, want to study something that looks like this, where we have these little, where we have these waves, but we also have kind of a secondary wave feature down here. These um, powers of trig functions or these polynomials of trig functions do get used. I mean, especially like What raising this to a power will do is flatten out these values. So in situations where we want these values to be flat, but still want these peaks to be kind of sharp, these powers of trig functions come in. And Of course, I'm using the cosine, but the graphs of the cosine and the sine look pretty similar. So that's a good trick to know. Let's see. What else? Anything do we want to do today? Basically, it we uh we touched on an example kind of like this at the beginning of class, where I just said, okay. You know, if we have X's and Y's, but instead of X's and Y's, we have sines and cosines or stuff like that. We can factor in the familiar way. And then we jumped right ahead and started messing around with the quadratic formula and kind of left factoring behind. But if we wanted to factor something like two cosine squared plus the cosine of X minus one, it's the same idea that we used when we were working with the quadratic formula. And the assumption here is that we know how to factor this. I don't know. I actually often find factoring a bit of a chore, but let's see if we can work this. Is the squared supposed to be above the U? It is not good, Cat. Thank you. Um, so to do factoring, we want numbers whose product is this first term times this last term. So numbers whose product is negative two and whose sum is this term. So then there's always sort of just trial and error and messing around, but positive two 
and negative one, we will do that. And then a trick, I forget what this process is called. This might be factoring by grouping. Well, in any event, the trick is then to break that U apart into pieces. So two U minus one U, where the, the two and the minus one are the numbers you found down there. Whereupon, uh, you look at the first two terms and you look at the last two terms and you ask yourself, well, what do these terms have in common? This first term, we've got a two in both of these and we've got a U in both of these. So we've got a two U in common. We'll pull that out. U plus one. Over here, we've got a negative one and a negative one. We'll pull the negative one out. And now this whole process has left us with a u plus one and a u plus one. We'll pull the u plus one out and get this factoring, two u minus one. And then, of course, that's it's not quite our answer, but we know what u is. We know that u is the cosine of x. The cosine of x plus 1, 2 times the cosine of x minus one, and there's our factory. of math that uses these polynomials. Whatever, it's not gonna come to me. And if it did, you probably wouldn't care that much anyway. Um, so that's it for this section.